Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Cynthia Bricks. She is a co-founder of Gender Equity and Reconciliation International, and she is an ordained interfaith minister with a background in women's issues and racial diversity. And Cynthia has a lot more going on than just that, but I will let her share more. So thank you so much, Cynthia. Why don't you go ahead and tell the audience a little bit more about yourself? Well, thank you for having me on your show, Sarah. Um, I am a white woman living in the United States and doing work globally and feel very fortunate to be part of the work that um, I co-founded with my um, now husband of many years. uh, And it's called Gender Equity and Reconciliation International, as you said. We have two program areas, actually. We have Dawn of Interspirituality as well, which um, the Gender Reconciliation and International program brings people from uh, women and men identified and people from all gender identities together um, into safe form to speak truth about gender and sexuality, truths around their life and and, um, what's been happening either in the past or currently in a safe form that is without shame or blame and really held in a place of compassion and love, if you will. Uh, The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice and corruption will never be healed by keeping them hidden or transformed by keeping them hidden, but rather by bringing them out into the light and confronting them with the power of love. And so that's the essence of the work that I do, which is part of me. It's just so interwoven with everything I do. And I'm, I feel very fortunate to um, be in this work in that way. The other program that I mentioned is Dawn of Inner Spirituality, and it's actually bringing people of different faith traditions and spiritual traditions together and people who identify as non-spiritual or uh, what is it, Uh, spiritual but not religious, um, together to create more friendships, to deepen into spiritual practice, to come into a a connection with the higher self, if you will, and the higher realms, the ultimate reality. And so both those areas really describe who I am in many ways. And in a real practical sense, I'm a mother of two children. I have a son who's 39 years old, Patrick, and a daughter who's 34 years old, Emily, and then a granddaughter who is four years old. And um, so what else about me? Um, I grew up uh, in the 60s, and so Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Junior was very influential in my life. And um, it's interesting that I'm now doing the work that I'm doing because I never set out thinking this is the career I want. In fact, I went to university in my uh, 30s is when I got my undergraduate and master's degree. And it was in health and wellness and gerontology. And uh, how I was introduced to the work I'm doing now is through my mother, actually. She went on sabbatical and she went to this workshop called Gender and Ecology. And she came back and she said to me and my brother and my sister-in-law, I want to gift you by sending you to this work, this workshop. And for whatever I screwed up in your life, this work will heal you. And so my brother and sister-in-law went right away, and it took me five years to get into my first workshop. And that workshop was the work that is Gender Equity and Reconciliation International now. In the original form of it, though, 30 years ago when it started, it started with the title of Gender and Ecology. And the question that uh, the premise of the work was the question of, are there parallels between the exploitation of the earth 
and the exploitation of the feminine? I think we probably all know the answer to that. And so the work was born out of the environmental community and really was addressing issues of the Me Too mo movement way back then, where um, in the activist, environmental activist communities, there were younger women working in that, um, in that uh, environment, in that community, and the older men were hitting on them, sexually harassing them, and they were leaving. And the women were leaving. And so a group of, of people, including my partner, the co-founder of this work, um, came together and said, we need to address these issues. And they created a, a forum for truth to be spoken. And when they came into the, that little workshop forum, they uh, didn't expect to have happen what happened, which was kind of an explosion from all these truths coming out. And many of the people in that workshop said, we have an earth to save. We have work to do out there. Let's put the lid on, pack on Pandora's box and we've got to get back out there. And others of them, including um, Will Keepen, William Keepen, who I keep mentioning, said, no, this is the work. We need, this is at root cause of everything that's happening out in the crisis of the world whether it's climate change, whether it's, you know, race relations, sexual harassment, all of these things at root have something to do with this too, around the gender issue. And so they started developing the work and creating a safer form for people to really speak truth. And um, over time, got more and more invitations to the work, um, to come and do the work. And it's grown into this whole international community now around the world um, doing what we call JERI in the um, kind of acronym of the work. Uh, and the, the work has been introduced now over the 30 years to about 28,000 people in 18 countries and on six continents. So going back perhaps to my um, my own life in relation to this. And I said, I never expected to be all of a sudden doing this work. I wasn't, I was in the health and wellness field, right? I, I was like on a trajectory there until my mother came and said, let me send you to this workshop. So I went to the workshop five years after um, she invited me into it and said she'd gift me with that. Uh, timing is just perfect, right? So I went to my first workshop, loved it. And then one month after that, I worked in Indianapolis in a health and wellness um, company. And uh, I had been there about six months, five or six months. And the chairman of the board, he, the co-founder of this company, he was 20 or 30 years my senior. So I was in my early 40s. And he was... 60s in his 60s. He was, he's world renowned, still is in the health and wellness field. He sexually propositioned me over dinner. He said, Cynthia, I've enjoyed getting to know you, and now it's time to take our relationship to a deeper, more intimate sexual level. I said no, and he continued to pressure me over the, the days back in the office. Um, I decided that I would bring it forward. I had to in some ways, because otherwise I would have had, I was getting pushed into a corner basically, where either I was going to have to sleep with them, I was going to have to quit my job, something was going to give. I couldn't avoid this, right? And so um, I brought it forward. And in that process of bringing it forward, I realized my privilege in being able to do that. I had always been a social activist in different forms, but here I was, and I always was working for the other, you know, whether it was race relations, gender relations, whatever. I was out working for other people, but here I was having to speak truth to my own violation and oppression that was happening in this company. And um, when I walked through the door to tell the HR person, uh, about it all, I remember feeling just 
all the the women sheroes, if you will, behind me from history, helping me walk through that door and speak truth. And my privilege was that I was a white woman, middle class, I'd say, a supportive family, that I could speak out and know that if I didn't have a job, I would still have a family that could support me while I found something else. So I did, I did that. Um, the, the, this man apologized. And when he apologized, he said, what, what can I do? He was in the room with the HR director, not knowing that I was going to speak to this. Um, and he, he said, what can I do? And I said, you can, you can stop doing what you've been doing. Because when you do it to one woman or one person, it has a ripple effect for everyone. Uh, I eventually, over the court, I took a week off, but then over the course of, of a few weeks, I got pushed out of that company. And um, when I got pushed, I mean, I was threatened with many things. I was called in on a, a evaluation and review Um interesting timing, <laughs> telling me I wasn't doing my job correctly. I needed to shape up or, you know, take a lesser job. All that happened within a couple of weeks of me bringing this out. When I got pushed out of the company, um, I, I had had to hire an attorney and I had one attorney and they had hired five attorneys to bring me down. And when I got pushed out, I did not trust men I didn't like men. I didn't want to be around men. I didn't know how to dress. I didn't know how to be in my body. Um, and I realized through a lot of therapy, because it was quite traumatic experience, because my whole world just shattered, right? I had gone to graduate school and I had made it. I had graduated. I was working at the upper realm in this company and I had made it. And within five or six months, it all just collapsed. Um, so I realized over time through therapy, but also spiritual practice that I couldn't go through the world, not liking men. And I had, I, over the time and, and actually in the gender work that, that happened, that incident happened one month after my first workshop in the gender equity and reconciliation work. And that was 23 years ago. Um, I realized that I, my heart started turning, I'd say, and realizing turning the rage and anger into more compassion, into deeper understanding for, for what was happening. It's not to take the, the accountability away from this man or the men in the corporation that were, this was happening with. And I would just say they were white men, upper class, older men in the corporate sector here. Um, and, but that, that we're all deeply embedded in the system of oppression and, um, what they weren't willing to do was to look at that and talk about it, which is where I was coming from. <laughs> Let's heal this. <laughs> and, uh, they basically said that's a buried issue and this is where we're going with it. Um, so I came into the work wounded and hurt and um, dismayed and left the health and wellness field pretty quickly and realized I just needed to do a deeper healing. And I came into this organization of Jerry um, as just an administrative assistant um, and, and took that time for a year or so to just kind of heal my heart from what all that had happened. And from that, I grew in the work. I knew it was the work I was meant to do. And going back to my childhood um, with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and the social justice, my parents were uh, hippies of the 60s and 70s, and they had my brother and me out marching against the Vietnam War and doing neighbor to neighbor and race relations. I went as a child. Um, I lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma in the U.S. was not complying with the federal regulations on integration. 
at that time. And so they were getting in trouble with the federal government. And so there was a group of volunteer parents, uh, parents who volunteered um, our children, their children, be included, to be bused into an all-black school all the way across town. And and so that was uh, an amazing experience and one of the best childhood experiences I ever had, I'd say, in the sense that I never felt in place or at home or even safe in the white middle upper class schools that I went to. And all of a sudden, when that opportunity came, I felt at home. And so with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and his influence on me in the 60s and all that was happening, I um, I really, I, my parents were atheist, agnostic, but in my little girl heart, I I held a prayer that, and I didn't call it prayer, but it was a prayer that um, if I could just get to know as many people in the world who were different than me, then I would come closer to the ultimate reality, to the divine, to God, by whatever name you call it, okay? Um, That connection with each person. And after I started doing the work with Jerry, um, it was probably maybe 10 years in, something like that. I was sitting in South Africa facilitating a work the work in a circle. And I looked around the circle. Here I am, this white woman from the United States sitting in South Africa. And there were brown people and black people and people all different gender identities, different languages sitting in that circle. And I thought, wow, that's that prayer come true. (laughs) It was manifest without me going to college or getting a degree to any sorts. I couldn't have even done what needed to be done to to get there beyond just knowing I was following what I'm supposed to do in this lifetime. So there's lots of ways we can go and continue to talk about all these great things you've had go on. But I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about school from when you were young and the integration being bused across Um, And what it was like for, you know, did you have relationship with the peers you left or like, did people look to your parents negatively because it was kind of this reverse situation um, that you were taking part in? Good question. I don't remember people looking at us negatively because I think because we, they were in their own circle of activists, of, you know, so it wasn't like we were, um, we weren't around other people that might, you know, buck that or think that it's not right or whatever. Um, yeah, it, my parent. I remember my parents coming to me, they had gone to a meeting uh, about this possibility. And they came to me and asked if I wanted to go to this school. And I was like, yes, please. (laughs) I, you know, school, I, I can think of public school in particular somewhat as a prison for children. You know, we kind of put them in there and, and expect them to sit up and follow the rules and all that. And this opportunity was not just meeting other people, but it was an open school. So it was a different kind of format for school too. That um, interestingly, it, the school is Burroughs Elementary School in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it was the same school my father went to as a child. And uh, at that time, the neighborhood was an all white neighborhood, and then it slowly changed to being black and brown people. And so when I went, of course, it was primarily African American school. It it just brings up um, just really warm memories. It was like like I said, it was like being home and being safe and being accepted for who I was because in my white school back in the other neighborhood where I lived, it just, I never felt like I fit in really. I mean, I was raised by hippie parents. so (laughs) 
that doesn't quite go together with the upper class necessarily. <laughs> so I was felt more like that was a problem uh, in you know getting pushback from people than being in a in a all black school or an integrated school at that time. So yeah. Right. Well, and and knowing that, you know, your parents were activist hippies, like seeing that you eventually got to where you are, like it kind of lines up with everything. Now, would you be willing to share a little bit more about kind of just the generic of what you were doing, like kind of career and stuff wise prior to um the incident in health and wellness that turned you towards Jerry, because you mentioned you didn't go to college more until your thirties and then health and wellness was a thing. But like, I feel like there was maybe this simmering for passion of gender equity and uh, spirituality and religious equity as well. Um, Thank you. That, yes. Um, well, I go back that through my teen years, my mother um, actually, my mother was the director of the first legal abortion clinic in Dallas after Roe versus Wade. So um, that was my teen years of her being in the front line with that um, and and seeing the women, but I would say not just our age or older, but even young girls as young as 12, 13, walking into the clinic and needing help and feeling the desperation and, and of, of anyone that walked in and took that courageous move to make that choice in their life when it's not an easy choice, you know? So that had a deep impact on me that way. Um, when I did go well then i got married at 19 um and so my life kind of shifted for about 15 years there um before i went to college i got divorced in my early 30s and um i had two children by then so i kind of took a hiatus if you will from my social activism and everything and um came back into college at that time when i did divorce and that was a whole awakening in me. And I started as a, in, as a student, as undergrad, I became the chair for the Planned Parenthood Student Association. And so I was very active there. I was very active with uh, women in communications because my degree first was in journalism and public relations. And then in my master's degree, I went to the health and wellness and gerontology. Um, so I see it as all weaving together. I remember in health and well, I mean, in the yeah wellness degree that I was doing my master's degree, which was body, mind, spirit, they called it back then in those days. Um, the spirit part was a bit foreign to me. Um, like I said, my parents were atheist, agnostic, and uh, I grew up in the Unitarian Universalist Church which I really appreciated because of the social activism. But as far as um, there was a rejection in the States, at least, and in the churches I was in, of kind of uh, anything to do with Christianity. There, the Eastern religions were very well embraced, you know, Buddhism and Hinduism, but that rejection of Christianity. And so in my health and wellness degree, that spiritual aspect of what is that and starting to look at that was very important. When the sexual harassment happened after I graduated with my degree, um, my, my master's degree, and that happened quite soon after um, the sexual harassment did, it really took me into an altered state, a transformative state. So it wasn't a mind thing of I've got to go do this next step. It was like the universe, however you see it, God, the universe, ultimate reality came in and said, we're going to mix you up here and get you set on the right track, right? <laughs> Not that I wasn't on the right track, because I think everything I've done to this point informs what I do now. Um, but in that process, I, 
I really felt a deeper calling to um, the spirit, to divine, to something that was missing in my activism. So I needed a spiritual foundation from to launch from. And so I decided, um, I started looking at, at um, divinity school. And I was a single mom by that point, And I knew I had to be mindful of, of, you know, where I was and everything. And I lived in Boulder, Colorado. And so I looked at Isla School of Theology in Denver. And I was so pleased to find out that Dr. Vincent Harding was there teaching. And he was a dear friend, close colleague with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. So it felt like I came full circle back in. I, I went to ILIF and uh, got my divinity degree. And Dr. Harding taught a class on human transformation. And so I remember being in that class. And he, he, in that class, we talked about the civil rights movement or the freedom movement of the United States. And if, if, if your listening audience hasn't heard of the, the movie or the series called Eyes on the Prize, I really recommend that because it, it's a series that you can get on Amazon, I think, and other places, PBS, that really does show in video, a film clip footage, about what happened in the history of the freedom movement um, in the United States. Now, of course, at that same time that that was happening, there were things happening in Vietnam. There were things happening in South Africa with apartheid. So nothing is held in a vacuum. There was this global thing, a global um, crisis happening everywhere. But it is interesting in the trajectory of my life, and I think all of us in some way can see that if we look back and reflect on our life of how, what is this incarnation about? What are we here for? And how is that thread woven throughout when we really respond to it and, and act upon and, and go forward with what we're called into, if you will? Um, and so I stepped into that. I remember going to divinity school and I remember, uh, when I announced it to my atheist parents, which was, whew, that was hard. I was sweating, <laughs> sweating that one. But my mother said, because I already had a master's degree, she said, well, have you ever thought of a doctorate in philosophy? Why divinity school? And my father said, um, you know, how are you going to pay with this? And I said, I, how are you going to pay for this? And I said, I don't know. Well, a few weeks later, after I applied, I went back to him and I said, well, the school gave me uh, a 60% uh, uh, scholarship for merit and 40% for need. So I got a 100% scholarship to go to ILIF to do what I felt called to do. And uh, it really has given me um, a beautiful way of being in my activism, spiritual activism. And I remember Dr. Harding. Um, saying, often saying that in the freedom movement, and it's called the freedom movement because it wasn't just about civil rights. It was a much bigger movement than just civil rights. Um, but he would say when the people gathered to go march like in Selma or wherever the marches or, you know, any kind of marches or demonstrations or um, were happening, he said they would gather together in community, they would sing together, and they would lean back into the hands of God that then pushed them forward into their activism. And I really love that because at times, even coming on this, on this show with you, Sarah, I sat for a few moments just quietly and called in my teachers those that hold me, you know, and I'm, I'm really happy that, I mean, happy, I don't know if that's the word, I feel so fortunate, I'd say, to have, we, in our community of Jerry, have a whole um, circle of teachers that hold us. So 
One is Jetsun Matinson Palmo, who's a, a, a Buddhist nun who has a nunnery in northern India that um, she is training and teaching women to become enlightened on the Buddhist path, you know. Um, we have Swami Ambikananda, who is in Reading, UK, who is a Hindu teacher um, who holds us as well. Sister Lucy Kurian, who is a Catholic nun, an Indian nun in Pune, India, who has a whole project for destitute women and children and men now too, um, taking them from the you know torments of oppression and abuse into safe uh, community, giving them uh, a new life. Uh, Father Thomas Keating, who is was he's not in his body anymore, but he passed a few years ago at age ninety five, and uh, he ha- he was uh, a monk. Uh, 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 he's a teacher of contemplative outreach. Um, founder of Contemplative Outreach and the inner, and the Snowmass uh, Interfaith um, community. And so, you know, we have these people. And then in the work, we've been blessed with the fact that uh, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu um, endorsed our work. Uh, and that has just, it, it, all of these, and, and, and the work is growing um, from that endorsement in South Africa and beyond. But we have all these leaders and teachers who I I call into my heart every time I show up somewhere to help, like uh, Dr. Harding was saying, leaning back into their hands and into the hands of, of the ultimate reality to help push me forward. And I think that's really important in the sense of our gender work, because we all say, all our facilitators and trainers say, we're not experts in gender. You know, I, we, are, we know the work we're doing. We have a, a model that works and has replicated throughout the world in different cultures. And we know that, and we're very skillful in facilitating that. But we're not experts in the gender field or anything. And at some level... Every one of us is an expert in our life and our story and in the gender piece that we bring forward or in the cultural piece or the race piece or whatever. And so, um, yeah, I just, I just need to say that about the me here is just Cynthia showing up and taking the next step in what I feel called to do, what I listen deeply and I know that I'm responding to. But it's not only a me, it's a really a we. Um, A we, a global community of people who were all showing up and saying, let's heal this together. Let's do this work together to deconstruct the systems of oppression that are keeping us chained. And let's do it with compassion. Let's do it with truthfulness, but compassion and healing intention, creating safety and creating ultimately agape love, the highest level of love that, you know, human beings can come into, all beings can come into. So you mentioned kind of all of the various people that, you know, their backgrounds, what they're helping with. Um, and you've also, you know, there, there are these teachers and teaching different ways. And you also have this book that a bunch of you wrote and kind of worked on. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Sure. So the book is called Gender Equity and Reconciliation, 30 Years of Healing the Most Ancient Wound in the Human Family. And, um, we have been around 30 years doing this work. And so this book uh, is really documenting that time period, those 30 years. The book features 20 co-authors from 10 countries, spanning a broad range of professional expertise and culture, race, gender diversity, representing thousands of years of combined experience. 
And then woven throughout the book are are voices and stories of dozens of leaders and participants from the diverse cultures that are religious, ethnic backgrounds, who have all been part of and experienced the Jerry work, the Jerry program. And then sections of the book um, focus on implementation of the Jerry program in the diverse context from prison, prisons to parliament, religious communities to academic ins- institutions, rural communities in Kenya and South Africa, to the United Nation affiliates in New York City. And then other parts of the um, Jerry Pro, other chapters focus on the Jerry program themselves in the various countries. If you take it all together, then um, these show the successful applications of the Jerry program in all these different contexts and diverse um, uh, places and people. And uh, it really shows through the book, we've heard reflections on just people reading it, of how they've had even healing experiences from reading the stories. So a lot of the book are narratives of stories coming out of the Jerry um, program and written around the transformational impact that it's had. And one thing I want to say that um, about the program is it's typically a three-day in-person process, sometimes longer, or a seven-week online process. And we enter into the, the program to create as much safety as possible. And that's the first part of the program. And that's done, everything is very experiential. Um, so it's not people up there lecturing everything every time. It's really us all going into the heart of what the gender issues are. And um, as we go into it, then we... we By the middle of the program, we're deepening in. So so we watch video clips at times uh, around the different gender issues and different representations of people. Um, Then we dip into it and we start sharing our stories, our personal stories around how we've experienced pain and suffering around gender and sexuality. And we witness each other and listen to each other deeply. And then by the end of that time, we come out of it. We don't leave everyone hanging there by the third day or the last session, but we come out and we really honor each other and honor ourselves for showing up with the courage to share our story and speak truth to what's happening. You know, the system of oppression, the systems of oppression don't want these stories to come forward. That's what keeps oppression intact. If we keep the stories invisible, if as long as they're kept silent and visible, stuffed down, then the system can keep going of oppression. And so our intention is to bring the stories out both for our, both for our own healing, but also knowing that when we speak, like when I speak my story, there are hundreds of thousands of other people identified as women behind me that have similar stories but might not have a safe space to speak. And the same is true for people who identify as men. It's same for people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans, or queer. And it's in being able to share these stories like my little girl dream and vision was the more people I know, the closer I can come to what this reality is all about. And so you mentioned the, you know, three day in person program or the online multi week program. Is that something that you all are hosting often? And like, is it constantly growing with new people? It is, and we're partnering with different organizations. So we partner with the Mankind Project, um, and we partner with Illumin, which is a men's rite of passage um, project. We partner with Charter for Compassion, which is a global um, uh, organization. And then Chrysalis um, Academy in South Africa is rolling out programs with the Jerry model that 
uh, is going into all kinds of different communities, rural communities, governmental communities, things like this. So, um, and, and just private individuals, individuals come to our work. Uh, we have three program areas. One is we call Me Too to We Together. That is focused specifically, primarily on people who identify within the binary. Um, and we break in, we separate into women's identified groups and male identified, men's identified groups. And then we have an LGBTQ program that's more fluid. And um, then we have a BIPOC program for Black, Indigenous, people of color. And ultimately, our vision and hope in however long it takes is that we can all sit and circle together. And we do that, too. Um, we do sit and circle together. But there's also an importance to separate into these separate groups to feel the safety. So, for example, for the BIPOC group to not feel that they have to change or be different because white people are in that room. And the same is true for LGBTQ people, that they, the allies are wonderful, and yet to feel the safety of being in their own group without having to make any changes. And, and for the, the group for men and women that is open to everyone, but just we identify and say we will move into those separate groups, um, you know, there's a level of work that needs to be done between people who identify as women and men, um, because a lot of the perpetration um, happens in those circles, right, and within those dynamics. Um, and so it needs to be addressed in the, that way. Yeah. Right. And I want to give you a chance before I start to wrap things up to share anything else that you would like with the listeners. The floor is yours. So I, I, I since I'm going back with my childhood, um, I'll share, I'll share two stories. Um, actually I'll share two stories and I'll share one of the gender work too. Um, if I have time, hopefully I have time. Um, one is for myself, uh, again, as a little girl, I remember going to a fountain, you know, where you throw a penny in or a coin in and make a wish. And I would always have that coin and I'd sit there thinking, my wish, my wish is for a baby doll or some toy or something. But then right as I'd release the coin and it'd go flying over to the fountain, I would wish for world peace. <laughs> quite a quite a big wish for a little girl. But that was my wish. And I still hold that vision that we truly can come into a place as a human society um, to bring peace on earth. And um, we've got some work to do, but that's why I continue to do this work. Um, I would like, I guess I, I'll just end with, with this story from the gender work. Um, that's a powerful story around forgiveness. We had a workshop and this woman came, I've changed her name. Um, I'll change her name for this story to uh, Dolores. And she came to the workshop and she shared deeply first as if in third person, like this story happened to someone else. And as it came out, it turned out that she and her children actually had a pact, a secret pact, that they would not reveal that this had happened in their own family. And what had happened is her husband, the father of her children, had been quite abusive. And he would um, dangle the, the children above the second floor, threatening to drop them while she was underneath, ready to catch them. At one point, he moved his mistress into the house and made her and the children sleep in the, the bathroom area, and he moved his mistress into the bedroom. Eventually, he died, and Dolores and her children were okay again. They lived um, years without any trauma or any abuse in their life. She came to our workshop and like I said, she slowly started sharing. And at one point, um, we do a truth forum where the women are in the center and the men are on the outside in silence and the women share. 
their stories with men witnessing, and then it reverses. And Dolores shared the fullness of her story with the men present. And it was such a transformative experience for her that when she left the workshop, we saw her a week later, and she came running up to us and she said, Cynthia and Will, I have something to tell you. After the workshop, I went to my husband's grave, and he had died like 20 years earlier. And I went to his grave, and I was able to forgive him for everything he had done. And then I went, and I found his mistress, who I hadn't seen in that amount of time, 20 years. And I knocked on her door, and she opened the door. She was in a wheelchair, and she said, come in. I've been thinking about you all week long. And she came in and she said, I know that I'm in this wheelchair because of all the horrific things I did to you and your children. And they were able to talk and reconcile and forgive. That doesn't have much to do with me, except that I showed up and facilitated the workshop and listened. And everyone in that workshop listened to each other. And the power of listening and sharing our story and truth brings forward that, that, uh, that opportunity for us to forgive and to reconcile. I'll just complete this story by saying in that same workshop, uh, we had the honoring ceremonies and the men uh, brought the women in, escorted us in, and sat us in a semicircle. And there was this uh, structure of chairs, one on top of the other, all built up in front of us. And then the men made a declaration that they would, they were committed and dedicated to breaking down the patriarchy, dismantling it. And at that moment, they pulled the bottom legs of the chairs out, and the whole thing came crashing down. And when it did that, the women were, ah, just took a breath away, right? And then they came by each of us and offered with warm water and lotion to wash our hands and, and massage our hands with lotion. And many of the women in that workshop had never felt the safe touch of a man before. But that just symbolizes and exemplifies the, the power of where we came through those few days, that that could happen. And of course, the women then offered a, a very moving ceremony as well. So um, the power of this work lives in me. It is what I'm here to do. And I invite anyone to step into it because there is no more time. We need to be doing this healing work whether it's this work or other work that you're doing out there to make a difference in the world. And, you know, it's so important for our children and grandchildren, but it's also, and for even if you don't have children and grandchildren, for your, your nieces, your nephews, for the children of the world, but it's so important for us. Won't it be nice to die and know that we have lived a full life and done amazing work to break down these systems of oppression, what better time is there than now? Yes, and those are some great stories to share here at the end. Now, I do ask all of my uh, guests a different question at the end, something just a little bit, you know, more lighthearted and different from what we've been talking about. So my question for you is, what is your most used emoji? The heart. <laughs> a specific color? Um, I move between uh, purple, green, and red. <laughs> and swirls. I use all the hearts. And if you ask my children, if, if they thought about what their mother's about, they would say love. And so it fits, right? All right, that brings this episode to a close. So of course, I will be leaving uh, the website for the Gender Equity and Reconciliation International in the description, along with some of their social media. 
I will also be leaving a link to the Eyes on the Prize series that Cynthia mentioned as well. So if you'd like to go check that series out, you can do that. And of course, if you'd like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description as always. That brings you to all of our past episodes, all past resources and everything like that. Along with our social media, we are on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you'd like to go follow those pages and if you'd like to be a guest on the show, my email is in the description as well. Feel free to reach out to me. And if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily, that support is always greatly appreciated. Then there is a link to do that in the description as well. So thank you so much, Cynthia, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sarah. Bye.